Hello again. So we've wrapped up part one in the Kamian text, that is the elements of music. So from here on out, we're going to be looking at music history. We're going to be looking at different periods, different composers, specific pieces of music, and also the sort of historical background, what's going on in the culture that produces this music. Because we can't really understand the music itself if we don't understand some of the, the culture and the historical background. Problem with this is that the book starts this historical examination in part two with the Middle Ages. And I think it's, um, there's, there are good reasons for starting with the Middle, Age, Middle Ages, and I'll talk about what those reasons are. But I think that <clears throat> we should look a little bit before the Middle Ages. We should look a little bit at ancient music because so much of what happened before then is so influential on what follows. So I think it's worth at least, let's say, a lecture, or let's say two brief lectures, which is probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to split this up into sort of a part one and part two, um, to look at music from before the Middle Ages. So if we're going to start looking at music history, I think it's important to define our terms. We've already defined the term music. Now we need to define the term history. And you might think, well, wait a minute, everybody knows what history is. History is just the past, right? No, it's not. Uh, the past does not necessarily equal history. Properly understood, history is actually a genre of literature that examines the past and uh, seeks to present the past in an objective factual way, as much as is possible. Of course, we're looking at the past and we, we don't have absolute knowledge of what went on then, but at least we're going to attempt to be objective and factual. And for example, where there is doubt about whether it happened one way or another way, we will mention that. We will, we will cite our sources and say, well, so-and-so says it happened this way, but someone else says it happened another way. So history was actually a thing that was invented. There is a guy, a, a first historian, who invented the genre of history. His name was Herodotus. And maybe I'll put a link up on uh, D2L so that you can learn about the first historian, Herodotus, who wrote about the wars between the Greeks and the Persians in the 5th century BC. Um, History, as, as uh, scholars understand it, human history, is usually broken down into four big categories. And the first of these, the earliest of these, is actually prehistory. You've all heard the term prehistoric, right? Right off the bat, that should tell you that history is not just the past, because if that were true, why is there such a thing as prehistory? How could there be something before the beginning of the past? What prehistorical means is human history before written records. Because in order to have history, you really need to have written records. Right? History is a, is a genre of literature. It's a thing that's written down. Now, of course, there are old legends and myths and traditions and folklore, whatever, that usually passed along orally from one generation to the next. But history is something different. History is an attempt to get it right, to get it accurate. Um, so these, these four big divisions are prehistory, ancient history, medieval history, and modern history. Right? And these are the the divisions that scholars have always traditionally used. So now that we are uh, on our way to becoming college-educated people, this is something that's important to know. Right? And you might, you've, you've probably heard of these terms before, but uh, it might be a little dusty in your mind, or you might never have been taught the reasons for these divisions. And they are kind of important, I think. So let's start with prehistory. Human history begins with prehistory. Well, 
and of course we have geological history that goes way back. I mean, we have the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, but human beings, of course, okay, we evolved from, you know, earlier types of hominids. I mean, Homo sapiens sapiens, right? People just like you and me. We go back about, depending on where you read, uh, at least 250,000 years. There were people just like you and me walking around on this earth 250,000 years ago. And of course, there were other types of hominids as well who were not Homo sapiens. Homo neanderthalis, etc., Neanderthal man, lots of other branches in the hominid family tree. But we're the only ones, apparently, who have survived. So, human beings just like you and me, let's say, 250,000 years ago, right? Now, we don't know a lot about, obviously, those people. They didn't leave written records. They did leave behind, let's say, their bones. Um, they left behind, actually, some of their artworks. They left behind musical instruments. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, they left behind campsites. Uh, they left behind arrowheads, things that we can carbon date so that we can track, let's say, their movements uh, out of Africa into Europe and Asia and across the land bridge into the Americas, all of this. Right? Uh, the musical instruments, by the way, we, we know, <laughs> we can infer that music was actually important to prehistoric people. How do we know this? Because they made musical instruments. Think about the life of a caveman, how hard that would be just to survive. Uh, you know, you, you're hunting and gathering, uh, you're trying to avoid being hunted yourself, uh, and yet these people actually made musical instruments. Uh, and I'll put a link up in D2L. Uh, in recent years, cave explorers and archaeologists have found flutes made from the leg bones of animals which are now extinct. And they found these flutes in caves, they've carbon dated them, and they are like 30, 40,000 years old. And, and these flutes were actually very skillfully made. You would take the, the leg bone of this animal, you would split the bone lengthwise so that now you've got two halves of a cylinder, right? hollow that thing out, you get the, the marrow out of the bone, and then you drill holes in half of that cylinder. Where did they get drills? I don't know, but cavemen had some kind of drilling capability uh, because there are holes drilled in precise places in these, in these leg bones. And then you would reattach the two halves of the leg bone, glue them together, they had some kind of glue, and now you've got a flute. And the archaeologists who found these flutes could actually pick them up and play them still. Right? So music was important enough to even prehistoric people that they took the time and trouble to make their own musical instruments. And there's also some speculation that even the caves that they chose to live in might have been chosen for their acoustics. Any of it, we've got uh, prehistory running from, let's say, around 250,000 years ago, let's say 250,000 BC, up until around, let's say, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. Now, actually, right off the bat there, I should clarify something. This is, again, one of those things that you might have thought that you knew, but maybe not. Uh, we know these terms... Uh, B.C. and A.D. And what do those, what do those stand for? Um, B.C. means before Christ. How about A.D.? A lot of people think that means after death. I'm not sure how that got so after Christ's death, which would mean that the years 1 A.D. to, I don't know, 33 uh, would have no designation because if AD begins at 33, that means, okay, what AD really means is Anno Domini, 
year of our Lord. Anno means year. Domini means Lord. The year of our Lord. Which, what it means is the years dating from Christ's birth. Which is why there's no year zero, by the way. A.D. 1 is the traditional year when Christ was thought to have been born. Now, even that is kind of interesting historically, because, well, how did people count the years before Christ was born? I mean, they, if they didn't know that he was coming, well, you know, did they know they were living B.C.? Did they count the years backwards, like the way that we do when we're looking at B.C.? Obviously not. Traditionally, um, these ancient cultures counted the years from the reign of some very important king or pharaoh or emperor, right? They would say, in the third year of the reign of Ramses or whatever. So the years started over again every time in, in whatever culture, whatever region you were in, every time there was a new king or emperor or pharaoh, the first year of his reign, you know, everything was always counted from the from the uh, the years of a king's reign. And since Christ, of course, was eventually, um, after the Christianization of the Roman Empire, Christ was seen as the king of kings, then it made sense to date everything from the time of his birth. Right? So this was done retroactively, obviously, hundreds of years after uh, Christ had died. Um, it was decided to uh, start running the calendar based on the year that he was thought to have been born. So that's A.D. 1. Okay, so um, ancient history begins, I don't know, roughly, let's say, around 6,000 B.C. And you can look at different sources, different historians, and they might give you a different figure. But, okay, well, what's happening around that time? Around that time, we have three significant developments happening. Number one, the invention of writing. Remember, you can't really have history without writing, without written records. So once there is, once there is writing, once there's written records, we can know an awful lot more about the people who produce those written records. And writing seems to have been invented by the Mesopotamians. Where's Mesopotamia? modern-day Iraq, part of that cradle of civilization that you might remember, that fertile crescent. This region of the modern, let's say, Middle East, stretching up, let's say, from the Nile Valley along the uh, eastern shore of the Mediterranean, what we call the Levant, and into Mesopotamia. It's an interesting word there. Mesopotamia literally means the land between the two rivers. Mezzo means in between. Remember, it means medium. Uh, mezzo soprano, mezzo forte. It's the same mezzo, really. It's spelled differently, but it's the same word. Mesopotamia is the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and this is where writing was invented. This is where the first uh, large-scale agriculture took place. This is also where the earliest cities seem to have sprung up. But three major developments that sort of mark the transition from prehistory to ancient history. Right? You might say the beginning of civilization. Okay, uh, ancient history runs from, let's say, I don't know, roughly 6,000 BC up until roughly, and, and this is a little bit arbitrary, but this is the, this is the time frame that, com, that uh, historians have traditionally chosen as they frame history, up to roughly 450 AD. Right? At least that's the term, that's the, that's the year that the book uses to begin the Middle Ages. So ancient history is the period between prehistory and the beginning of the Middle Ages, roughly, let's say, 6,000 or so B.C. up to 450 A.D. Well, what's so special about 450 A.D.? Actually, nothing. Nothing in particular happened in 450 A.D. But we like to round things off, and we like to have, for example, years that end in a zero. There are a lot of things happening in the 5th 
century AD, that is the 400s. This is another thing to remember. When we're talking about centuries, like right now, we're in the 21st century because we are in the 2000s. Once we get to the year 2101, we will be in the 22nd century. So the 5th century AD are the 400s AD. What was happening in the, let's say, the mid-400s AD? Well, in the West, that is, in Europe, something quite catastrophic was happening, and that was the disintegration, the collapse, the fall of the Roman Empire. Not the entire Roman Empire, actually, only the Western half of it. When people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, what they really mean is the Western half of the Roman Empire, because there was an Eastern half that continued on for another thousand years. Right? And it had its own problems and issues over those thousand years. But interestingly, it's the, the disintegration, the collapse, the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire that has traditionally marked the end of the Middle Ages. That's what happened around 1450. Actually, it was 1453, if we want to be exact, it was May 29th, 1453, that the Eastern uh, Roman Empire came to an end. I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on, but the period between the fall of the Western Roman Empire, which again didn't really happen on a certain day, 450, I guess you might say the, the last Roman emperor was kind of gently nudged off the throne in 476 AD, but he was kind of a figurehead. He was actually a 14-year-old boy. He didn't really have any power. He was kind of a figurehead. And when he was deposed, there was not another Roman emperor. And that's when, the, at least in the West, and that's when the Western Roman Empire ceased to exist. And regional tribal chiefs or kings or what have you took over. Uh, and there was really no authority, central authority from Rome anymore. But the eastern half of the empire continued on for another thousand years, and it's the fall of that eastern half in 1453 that traditionally historians recognize as the dividing line between the medieval world and the modern world, medieval history and modern history. Now, these, these events might seem kind of arbitrary, and in a way they are, but if you study everything that happened around that time, the implications of the breakdown of the authority of the Roman Empire in the West in the mid-5th century, and the breakdown of the Eastern Empire, and the, the, the other events that that led to, it actually makes quite a bit of sense. Anyway, um, the modern era begins, according to the book, 1450. And again, historians might say, well, it's really 1453. Or, or they might even say, well, the Renaissance really begins maybe closer to 1400. So historians like to quibble and argue in their points of view about when we should place that dividing line. And remember, these dividing lines, these eras, they're kind of artificial anyway. What they are, they're, they are constructs that help us organize and think about history. So they do have value. But it's not like anybody, you know, woke up on January 1st, 1450 and said, oh, thank God the Middle Ages are over. Now we've got a renaissance and modern history can begin. No, right? These divisions are created by people who come along after the fact, historians, who look back and say, hmm, it might make sense to, to divide things up this way. Here is a major turning point and here's another one, and they sort of bracket an era of history. Anyway, modern history, let's say, begins around 1450, and the first sort of sub-era within modern history is the Renaissance. Um, now, when you think of the Renaissance, you might think of, I don't know, people like uh, Christopher Columbus, uh, or William Shakespeare, or whatever. And you might not think of these, but the, what, modern people. Yes, 
Columbus was a modern person. Shakespeare was a modern person. He belongs to this same period that historians call modern, the modern era, just like us. And when you think about it, those people did not live all that long ago, right? Right, so let's say Columbus. Well, you know, he lived over 500 years ago, but 500 years is really nothing. Remember, human beings like you and me have been on this earth for 250,000 years. 500 years is nothing. This is one of the things I'm, I'm trying to uh, impart to you in this class. It's more than just about music. It's about culture generally and history and trying to get an appreciation of history. And by appreciation, sort of like the, the book, you know, the music and appreciation, it's not that I'm necessarily... Uh, trying to get you to think, oh, history is wonderful, I love studying history, that kind of appreciation, or that classical music is so great, you must appreciate this music because it's better than your music. That's not, what I, that's not really the, the meaning of that. To appreciate something is to sort of stand back and get a perspective on it and understand it. So one of the one of the sort of main goals that I have in this class is to get an appreciation of history and culture. And that's actually kind of larger and more important than just music, because music is just a one part of history and culture. Okay, so now we understand this division, hopefully, of prehistoric, ancient, medieval, and modern. All right, so uh, music in the ancient world. Well, we might start with, well, what is the oldest piece of music that we know of? Well, uh, actually, they're the oldest of the oldies, and I'll put a link up again in D2L, is something known as the Hurrian cult song. The Hurrian cult song. This is the oldest, by far, the oldest piece of recorded music. What do I mean by recorded? It wasn't recorded onto CD or even vinyl record. It was recorded onto a clay tablet. It was written down by uh, a process known as cuneiform. Cuneiform is when you take um, a, a, a sort of a plate full of clay and then you take uh, wooden sticks that have certain specific impressions carved on the end of them, and you make impressions into the clay while it's soft. And then you bake the clay, and now you've got a tablet with these markings, you know, uh, that are left there. And uh, this brings up uh, actually kind of an important point. These clay tablets... Uh, of the Mesopotamians, the person, the, the people who, who invented this uh, system of preserving records. Remember, this is, again, this is the cradle of civilization where they invented writing, where they invented uh, agriculture, where the first city sprang up. These are also the people who gave us the oldest of the oldies, the Hurrian cult song. This, this piece of music dates to, back to about 1400 B.C., and what it is, it's a, uh, it's a hymn, it's a praise and worship song to the wife of the moon god, Nikal. And, um, you know, it's important to praise the wife of the moon god correctly, because what could happen if you displease her, if you don't show her proper respect well, your crops could fail, there could be a plague, who knows what could happen. So this is important to get it right. That's why you would want to write it down. You'd want to preserve it. And, and we find that most ancient music that was written down and preserved has some kind of a religious function. Right? There was probably an awful lot of music that was never written, written down or preserved in some way. But that which was considered important enough to be written down usually had some kind of religious function. Um, now, actually, this brings me to one of our, our most important points about ancient music. And this is why the book starts with the Middle Ages rather than getting into ancient music. The fact is that we have very few 
examples that have been preserved to the present day of ancient music. Remember, this is, the, this is an inherent difficulty of the fact that music is an art form which does not exist in space, and it doesn't exist on some kind of physical medium, unlike, let's say, the visual arts. Even, at, let's say, a cave painting, it exists on a cave, and as long as it's been preserved, you can go to the cave, you can find the cave, and you can look at the drawings. Uh, the kinds of little statues and figurines that, that ancient people made. As long as they've been preserved, you know, you can look at them. But music doesn't necessarily have to be preserved in this way. Music is something that exists in time, and when the time is over, it's gone. Um, if we have a written piece of sheet music, right, a written score, that's not really the music. That's the directions on how to play the music. The music is something that exists in vibrations in the air temporarily, and then it's gone. And we might have written records to preserve how to recreate it, but then again, we might not. Um, and the reason that there is so little music from the ancient world that has been preserved to the present day is that so little of it was written down in some form of decipherable notation. Right? What do I mean decipherable? Meaning written down in such a way that we could figure it out, because this is another problem. Ancient musicians, when they did write something down, they didn't use the same modern system of notation that we use. They didn't use the staff, the five lines and four spaces, little note heads, so that you could look at it and say, oh, uh, this is music. No, they had their own system uh, or systems of music notation, uh, which, unless you are aware of what it is, you might be looking at a, a, a piece of stone or a clay tablet and not even realize that there's music written on it. You might not be able to figure out even what's on there. Right? Okay, so... When you think about it, for a piece of music from the ancient world to have made it to the present day so that we could find it, decipher it, make a recording of it, right? There are a lot of hurdles there. So for one thing, most music of the ancient world probably was not written down because it just wasn't considered important enough to be written down. Some of it was. It's not that there is no written music. It's just that there is very little of it. Most of it probably wasn't written down. That which was written down would have had to have been written on something very durable, like a clay tablet or stone, in order to have made it all the way to the present day. Right? If it was written on paper, and they, you know, they didn't even really have paper back then, they had parchment, uh, or if you were if you were with near the Nile Valley, let's say in in ancient Egypt they had papyrus because th that's where the papyrus plant grew. Uh, other places stuff might be written down on animal skins or like the Mesopotamians, you would write on clay tablets or you would chisel something into stone, right? But something would have to have been written on something very durable like a clay tablet or like stone, in order for it to survive for thousands of years, maybe get buried, maybe then get discovered thousands of years later. I mean, think about it. The odds of some tablet with a piece of music on it uh, being, let's say, lost and then found again are very remote. Right? So that's why we have so few examples. There are probably only a dozen or two and most of those are fragments, uh, examples of, of music from the ancient world. And that's why the book starts at the Middle Ages, because beginning with the Middle Ages, this is when we start to have significant amounts of music that are actually written down. Um, however, although we don't have a lot of actual music that's been preserved, we do know quite a lot about the importance of music in certain cultures. We know, for example, about um, the instruments themselves that were played in certain cultures because there were depictions of them. That is, there were uh, 
paintings or statues which showed people playing musical instruments. So we can look at those paintings and say, aha, that's what an ancient Greek harp looked like or whatever. Uh, we also have uh, writers, sometimes philosophers um, or historians writing about music. So Plato, for example, writes quite a bit about music. Um, we know that, for example, the Greeks uh, had music competitions. We know that music played an important role in their uh, religious observations. Um, we know, for example, that ancient Greek drama um, was in large part sung. And in fact, the, the Greek dramas seem to have had their origins in, in choral competitions, right? uh, which were later incorporated into religious festivals, which is when all those, those ancient Greek dramas were performed. Speaking of the Greeks, by the way, the next lecture is, going to be, is going to, mostly going to focus on the Greeks. Many of the words that we use when we talk about music come from the Greeks. Music itself is a Greek word. It's related to muse, uh, you might have heard that term before, like uh, a muse is, is a, uh, someone who inspires, let's say, a writer or a creative figure. You know? The muses were actually uh, Greek goddesses, were daughters of Zeus, and each one had some sort of a role in inspiring uh, the arts. Uh, the, the muse of music was Calliope. Um, and there were other muses that specifically kind of worked their magic on creative human beings. Music is a Greek word. Um, chorus is a Greek word. Orchestra is a Greek word. Lyric is a Greek word. Uh, lots of the different words that we, uh, that we associate with music are of Greek origin, which makes sense because so much of our culture really uh, has its roots in the ancient Greeks. Okay, so um, I think I'm, I'm going to leave it there for now, uh, and next time I'll talk more about the Greeks specifically, and most of the, the questions relating to ancient music will be about the Greeks. So I will post some stuff up on uh, D2Well for you to look at, and uh, I'll have one more uh, relatively brief lecture on ancient Greeks and their music next time.